Dr. Croft. Hi, you must be Brian. Hi, thank you so much, yeah. I'm Dr. Croft, please come in. Boy, it's so strange to be seeing other human beings again. Oh, I know. Well, why don't you go ahead and lay on the couch and make yourself comfortable. You can go ahead and take that mask off if you like. Oh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to see me today. I am really in need of some help, and it just, it's just been such a stressful time. Well, I really hope that we can help you uh, get to the bottom of what's been troubling you. Uh, before we get into anything, though, why don't we uh, get to know each other? My name is Dr. Croc, and I've been helping professional and amateur musicians with their problems for many, many years, sometimes with startling results. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what's been troubling you? Well, I had a somewhat typical musical upbringing. Um, I started at the piano, but I was often really discouraged. And why do you think that was? Well, to tell you the truth, it was because my twin brother, Mitch, was like a child prodigy. And every time we would go to our week weekly piano lessons, he would be just flying through the material and graduating all of our method books. And I would barely make any progress. So. You know, I just wanted to quit all the time. But you must have stuck through those feelings, no? Because you decided to become a professional musician. Hmm, that's fascinating. So maybe you could think back and tell me, what was it that first made you want to become a musician? Well, you know, I do remember as a kid, the f we went to go see a puppet show. <laughs> And the puppets were like singing opera. And I remember that Christmas I got my first CD. And it was called Opera Aria's Greatest Hits. And I loved it, even as a little kid. But then as I got older, you know, I started to naturally want to rebel. And so I remember my mom took my brother and I to the mall one day. And I went to a store called Sam Goody. And there I bought a record by Pantera called Far Beyond Driven because I thought the cover looked cool. It had a picture of like a, a screw going into a human skull. Anyways, that made my mom cry, and she was really upset with me when she heard the brutality of that music. Now that is very interesting, and we'll definitely get back to that, but continue, please. Well, yeah, so after that point, I started taking saxophone lessons, and my saxophone teacher started showing me guys that he liked on the saxophone, like Michael Brecker and Bob Berg and Pete Christlieb. And I guess I worked my way backwards through jazz history from those guys. I remember that the first jazz CD I owned was um, Two Blocks from the Edge by Michael Brecker. I remember taking my bike to uh, Best Buy and buying it with my allowance. And it was basically at that point that I decided to become a professional musician. I, uh, you know, I just was torn between heavy metal music and jazz. <laughs> I played guitar and took guitar lessons, but I was also really into the saxophone. I loved, I loved them both. And so I just had to make a decision and I decided to devote myself to studying the alto saxophone <laughs> as my main instrument, but that I would continue to practice all the woodwind doubles and also to practice guitar and piano. And has, has that been difficult for you? Yes, it's been so difficult. I mean, I remember Charles Pillow telling me that in order to be a really good doubler, you have to treat each instrument as your main instrument for a while. So, you know, I've had years where clarinet was my main focus, and years where flute was my main focus, and years, including recently, where the oboe's been my main focus. But... I always just seem to find myself coming back to the saxophone. The alto saxophone, it feels like home. I guess it just feels safe to me. Now there I think you've stumbled on a very important area. See, it's really important that music is a safe space for us. Yeah, but you know, I don't always feel safe. Like, I wish I could internalize music theory better and more easily. Well, may I make a suggestion? Yeah, please. Have you ever considered studying Bach's chorales? No, not really. Well, 
The reason I ask is because I think they might contain a key to understanding Western harmony and melody. In fact, my personal mentor, Nadia Boulanger, she used to insist that each of her students memorize one chorale every week. And not only that, but we had to be able to sing any one voice while playing the other three voices on the piano. And, you know, it's interesting to think because that's something that composers as diverse as Philip Glass, Elliot Carter, Burt Bacharach, Michel Legrand, Darius Mio, Quincy Jones, Aaron Copeland, Egberto Gismonti, Astor Piazzolla, and even Donald Byrd had in common. Wow, it would, it would really seem that studying Bach's chorales is a key to unlocking musical secrets, regardless of style or genre. Yeah, well, it would certainly seem so. But still, how can I consider myself a professional musician if I need a therapist? I mean, recently I started doing work for Maria Schneider. Oh, wow. She is really wonderful. Has this been a source of stress? Well, honestly, not really. I mean, she's really, really nice and easy to talk to. But I did make one huge mistake last year, and I had a pretty big anxiety attack. Um, you know, I don't really know how it happened, but on one of her charts that I was supposed to do the copying work for, I put the chord changes in the wrong key. Oh, man. So she called me to let me know, and do you know what she did? And what's that, Brian? You know, I was thinking to myself, this is it. That's the end of my career. Maria's never going to want to work with me again. But instead... She called to tell me the worst mistake that she ever made when she was doing copy work for Gil Evans. And it made me feel incredible. It, it was so nice. Wow, that's, that's really nice. I hope that you internalize that moment and remember that we all make mistakes, Brian. Oh my gosh, wow, we've already got to the end of our session. Um, is there anything else that you might want to ask me before we have to wrap up? Well, I've got so many questions, I don't even know where to start. But, um, you know, I really have to say thank you so much, Dr. Kroc. It's really nice to have somebody to talk to, and I really can't wait for our next session. Ah, uh, well, it's my pleasure, of course. Well, before we go, I just want to ask, because I have a gig this week, and I have to play a composition called Saturnine. And it's just full of so many complex polyrhythms. Mm -hmm. And every single measure is in a different time signature. And it's well, a nightmare. And I don't even know where to start. Like, how am I supposed to even play this tune? Like, I don't even know. And it's just going to be so embarrassing when I get with the band mm -hmm. and I don't even know how to play it. Well, you know, this isn't really my specialty, Brian, but uh, I can think of a colleague that I can refer you to. His name is Dr. Kim Cass. And he's really on the forefront of this sort of ultra-complex polyrhythmic music. Let me write down his number for you. And you can go ahead and give him a call. And I'll also call him and tell him to expect you. And, you know, I think, I think he'll definitely be able to help you out with that problem. Okay? Okay. All right. Good. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Kroc. What a relief. I'll definitely give him a call. I really appreciate you. Yes, hello. This is Kim Cass. Rhythmic therapy. How may I help you? Hi, Dr. Cass. Um, my name is Brian. I've been having some, some musical issues, and my therapist, Dr. Kroc, recommended that I call you. Um, do you think you might have a second to sort of help me out with some problems I've been having? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, what seems to be the issue today? <sighs> well, I've got this music I have to learn that has a bunch of polyrhythms. And I frankly have no, not even the slightest clue, like, how to deal with them. There's just so many different numbers and ratios and... And I'm just like, it's kind of making me freak out inside because I'm so stressed. Yeah, I feel you, man. I think that, uh, I think we can hook you up today. Hope we can answer some of your questions, get you, uh, get you on the right track for <sighs> relaxation. 
That's such a relief to hear. I, I, I really hope that you can help me out. All right, let me go ahead and ask you, what are these rhythms that are getting you all riled up? I see this one, the first bar of the song has five over three. And I just don't even really know what that means. You've got to know how many beats it is. Um, sometimes people might actually be talking about three over five, but it's five over three we're talking about, okay? Okay. And it's super catchy. That's the thing, they're all catchy. The way I would think of that is three beats divided into five subdivisions in each beat, right? And you're gonna play every third note of those quintuplets. You should really be able to sing all these rhythms in order to get them properly. So like for that one, uh, you got three beats, right? One, two, three. See how it's kind of catchy, you know, and then if you want to spice it a little bit, you can take that last hit, that last three note pickup and maybe switch it to four notes, squeeze four notes in, you know. Something like that. How do you practice these things? Well, I learned most of these rhythms without my instrument, so kind of like we're doing right now. Um, just because I was out and about and I would just learn these rhythms, I would, I would write them out and then I would learn, I would practice singing them and, and, and just kind of drumming them. You can get more advanced ones and kind of string them together and create like a little obstacle course for yourself to deal with, sing through, and compose with ideally. Everyone uses them, learns them, and, and executes them a little bit differently, you know, and um, I think the important thing that I've discovered is that the result of using these and uh, getting them, so it's actually like a free result. Look at their kind of organic, kind of loose feeling music comes out of it, but it's super precise, you know. It's, it's emulating something natural, but it's, um, it's different. It's sort of like feels organic. It like lets the music sort of break out of a, of a sort of box rhythmically. What inspired you to like get so deep into this? After I started checking it all out, I kind of searched it out, you know, and I, I found um, just a lot of different stuff. I remember hearing Matt Mitchell and when I used to live in Oakland, he came through and was playing some nasty stuff on the piano and that was pretty eye-opening. There was a uh, there was a musician, Nobukazu Takemura, I remember loving, like this electronic musician that had some pretty interesting stuff. A lot of classical. I remember Morton Feldman for the first time when I heard him. This is all starting to make sense to me, but like, I think I need to hear it in the context of like some actual music. I've got something that I just prepared that's basically uh, three polyrhythms linked together. So one after the other. And then there's like kind of a bar of four where you can reset and like get your bearings. The rhythms are that the first one we discussed, five against three, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be seven against five. So that's going to be five beats divided into seven, playing every fifth note of those septuplets. And then the next bar is seven against nine. So that's going to be nine beats divided into sevens, playing every ninth one, right? Okay. And then there's a bar of four. You have to spend a lot of time with them, and then you become like addicted to them, which is the goal, you know? You could really write some nasty stuff out and keep it going and expand it. As far as practicing these things, this is kind of the way for me that's really helpful. Do you think you could uh, maybe like sing the, the different subdivisions uh, just so I could hear it? Sure. Does practicing these 
really complex rhythmic relationships improve your time when you're just playing like straight ahead swing or like when you're just playing a session with your buds i think it that only improves your time i mean there's a total great point that like swing is actually more difficult or as difficult i mean i don't i don't really see things that way but um spending all your time on something like this where it's very you know straight in a way it's um it's not everything. Like I, I just try to focus on swing and just like fundamentals and playing in tune. Because like you can get, you can go down a rabbit hole and then all of a sudden realize you've neglected <laughs> other things. You know, I don't think it helps you swing, but I think it helps your time. All right, everybody, there you have it—the first episode of Music Therapy. Thank you so much to Kim Cass. He is a f brilliant person, obviously. Go check out his music. If you have questions that you want me to deal with in my next therapy session with fake Dr. Croc, you can leave comments below or follow me on Instagram. I'm going to be doing Q&As probably about once a month and screen grabbing my favorite questions to answer. So thanks again and uh, see you next time.